I screw this up, David? Huh? This is going to be a great evening. Uh, you, in fact, are in for a treat. You have two rock stars. One is David Gergen, who uh, is going to be the moderator tonight, and the other is my friend John Kasich. David advised five presidents. Four and a half, actually. Well, <laughs> I'm saying five, because it was the campaign for one, right? Um, he is a noted author. He is a political journalist and a TV analyst. He's been on TV as long as I can remember, and I always listen to him because he's a very wise man. He's the co-director for the Center for Public Leadership and the public service professor of public service at Harvard Kennedy School. You guys see a lot of him, I admit. You're kind of a dime a dozen. Too much, yeah. yeah. But he got his youth, in his youth, he was a Yaley, he was a Harvard Law School student, and an officer in the Navy, which I think shaped you in many ways. So now, about my friend John Casey. I was a damage control officer in the Navy. It was great preparation for government. It was. <laughs> <laughs> so my friend John Kasich, four years in the state senate, 18 years as a member of Congress where he chaired the budget committee. <clears throat> the budget hadn't been balanced since 1969, and when he came in as the chairman, he balanced it four years in a row, had surpluses, and when he left, we've had deficits. He uh, had 10 years in the private sector, creating jobs, making a little money, supporting his family, uh, helping to create new businesses. And this is his seventh year in Congress, and he turned around an $8 billion shortfall into surpluses. He did it by $5 billion of tax cuts that grew the economy and helped bring in more revenue. He did it by uh, cutting waste and cutting red tape. And he did it working with Democrats. He works with Republicans and Democrats and unaffiliated voters. He's the author of three best-selling books, and this is his fourth book, Two Paths, American Divided or United, John Kasich. You can't buy it here. You can buy it at the co-op store, and would like to make this his fourth bestseller. Say that again. <laughs> 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 now, I don't want you to laugh because what I'm saying next is true. John Kasich is the Tom Brady of politics, and there's a reason why. The strength of Tom Brady was he made everyone on his team be better than they ever thought they could be. That's what John Kasich does in government. In the budget committee, we were going to balance the budget. He helped us see how we could do it, and he inspired us. Uh, he gets his team to outperform themselves. As a leader, John shares the credit and he's willing to take the blame. I don't know many politicians like that. He listens, he learns, he leads, and then he listens again. He is shaped by his faith in God, <clears throat> love of country, devotion to his wife, Karen, and his two twin uh, daughters, 17-year-old daughters, Emma and Reese, and the people he represents. He listens to the people he represents, and he's shaped by them. And John, I just have so much admiration for you, so it's a privilege to be able to introduce you. Thank Buy you his book. <laughs> well, like Tom Brady, I haven't noticed you at the White House lately. <laughs> you know, I was there. Oh, yeah? I was there, uh, when was it, Beth? About, about six, eight weeks ago or something like that. I, yeah, I was invited, and I went in, and uh, it was, uh, hmm, Tom Brady wouldn't drop this. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I went, David. They called and invited me, and, you know, I was with President Obama in the, in the lame duck session on yeah. the trade agreement, and then I turn around, and I find myself uh, in there with, um, uh, with, the tr with Donald Trump. So I spent a pretty good chunk of time in the Oval Office, mm -hmm. and he asked me, uh, I had just come back from Munich with McCain at a defense conference, and you know, I told him, I said, you know, the, the fact is, is you could send everybody in your administration, but they don't really care about what they say. They care about what you say. And, um, and then I told him a little story, because when I first became governor, you know, I, I'm, I was kind of a little bit of a smart aleck, and I was you know, saying what I thought were clever things. And we had a rocky first bit of time, and my wife one day came to me and she said, you know, you're the governor of Ohio, John. You're the father of Ohio. Why don't you act like it? And so I, uh, I told the president that story. 
Um, and then, <laughs> and then we talked. Really warmed uh, things up, right? Well, no, I mean it was very pleasant. Yeah. And then we talked about healthcare and a little bit about trade. And my, cons you know, and he listened politely. We had a nice meeting. I was there. I don't know, 45, 50 minutes, something like that. And he brought, kept brought some people in. And you know, I, I'm, I, I'm. Somebody said, well, you know, you, you guys got to patch things up. I said, I'm not interested in patching anything because I don't need anything that needs to be patched. I'm not mad at anybody, you know. Um, so uh, it, I'm glad I went in and I'll help them. And I, in the meeting, I did say that when the president does a good job, I will praise him. And if the president doesn't do a good job and, and I'm not, you know, out of bounds, I'm going to criticize him. And there was a voice in the room that said, we noticed. And... Uh, <laughs> So, you know, I've been that way with all presidents, uh, starting with Reagan and with Bush Sr. And uh, I went to Congress when I was 30 years old, and I was elected to state Senate when I was 26 and didn't know anybody, and I, I didn't have a relative in Ohio. And so, you know, you call them like you see them, right? And let the chips fall where they may. I don't report to the Republican National Committee to develop my opinions. <laughs> uh, well, let us have one opinion on the table. We're delighted you're here. We're proud you're here. Thank you, sir. And I want you to know, uh, I, my last report was, if you'll notice, we have an absolute full house, and it was done by lottery. People came by lottery, and we've had one of the highest applications that the, that the Institute has seen. There were, there were more than double the number of people are in here who wanted to hear you tonight. So I think that says something about you are connecting, and. But I, I, what I'd like people to do before we get into the policy, because there are a lot of issues on the policy side, I'd like to, I think that people are really interested in your journey. You asked in your book, you know, you, you thought back to your <coughs> childhood and you said, how did, how did little Johnny Casey get from McKee, Pennsylvania, all yeah. the way, 26 years old, got elected to state senate, the youngest person ever? Well, I, my, my mother was a, a pioneer in talk radio. When mm -hmm. the person on the radio would say something, she would yell at the radio. <laughs> and, uh, and, my, and my mother was very, very articulate. I mean, and always told me, you have to tell it like it is. My father carried mail, and he had a little twinkle in his eye, and mm -hmm. you know, he knew everybody's business. And he, you know, you put those two things mm -hmm. together. Now, I was more like my mom, uh, a little bit more of a combination now. So I went to Ohio State, make a long story short, I got upset in the first couple weeks and asked for a meeting with the president of the university and I couldn't get in and then they let me in. I went in to see him and he had a big office and all these things and I said, uh, I said doctor, I, I've been in school a couple weeks and I'm undecided, but when I look around at the office, the furniture and everything, maybe this is the job for me. What exactly do you do? <laughs> and he said, well, I have academic and fundraising responsibility and tomorrow I'm gonna go down and see President Nixon and I said, well, I got some things I'd like to say to him. Could I go with you? And he said, <laughs> and he said no. And uh, <laughs> I said, well, if I write a letter, would you give it to him? And he said, I, I could do that. So I went back to my dorm and I wrote a letter. It was mostly favorable. It was right after Kent State, a year or so later. And I said, you know, I wrote the letter and I signed it sincerely, John Kasich, P.S. If you want to discuss it further, let me know. I can come and see you. And um, so a couple of weeks later, I got a, a letter back from the White House, office of the president. And I opened it up. I read it. I went upstairs. I called home. And my mother answered the phone. And I said, Mom, I'm going to need an airline ticket. The president of the United States would like to have a meeting with me in the Oval <laughs> Office. And my mother was shouting, honey, pick up the phone. There's something wrong with Johnny. <laughs> So I flew down, make a long story short, because we have a lot we have to do here tonight, but to make a long story yeah. short, uh, they told me I was going to get five minutes, and I'm thinking, you know, five minutes, I got a new, new jacket, new shirt, new tie, new pants, five minutes, you kidding me, I'm not coming out of there, so, uh, but I spent 20 minutes in the mm -hmm. Oval Office, I was 18, I applied for a job at the White House, didn't get it, applied the next year, got a job working at the National Library of Medicine at the National Institutes of Health, I graduated in December. I was going to go to law school. I went looking for a job, couldn't find one. I saw the state house. I walked in there, never thinking I could get hired there because if you don't know anybody, how can you get anywhere? And a guy and I got hired on a Friday, and a guy got fired and, uh, in in this internship. So I went in and I did that, and I quit my job. I ran for the state senate, knew nobody, grassroots total, and won at the uh, at the age of 26. They took my district away. I ran for Congress at 30. I beat an incumbent at 26. I beat a, an incumbent at 30. I was the only Republican to defeat an incumbent Democrat in 1982. So I went down there at the age of 30, became a defense reformer. Uh, Chris didn't mention that. I was big on defense reform. 
and then got on the budget committee. And then I quit after we got the budget balance. I said, I've had enough, I'm leaving. And um, went out and had a, had a great, uh, great experience. I worked, uh, for an, I worked for Lehman Brothers. I had a two-man office in Columbus, and from there I bankrupted the entire company. <laughs> and, uh, and I worked for, uh, for Fox News. Uh, How did I get that job? I just walked in and said, I'd like to do a show. And they said, okay, we'll hire you for a year. And then one led to more. And, and then I also uh, taught a little bit. I taught at A&M, Penn, and Ohio State, just real a little bit. And I was writing these books, which was really cool. And um, I did something else that was cool, but I can't remember what it is now. And then I got a, feel, I got a calling. Let me tell you, I, this, is, uh, this is really something that you need to hear. I was buzzing along quite fine. It was great. I mean, I was making speeches. People were paying me money. It was, it was really great. And one day, I was down in Florida. And I was really struggling with the decision to run, run for governor. And um, I was debating. I, I didn't debate. I was a motivational speaker. But I, once in a while, I'd do a political event. And I was with Terry McAuliffe. And they said, it was a trucking association. And they said, you guys have 15 minutes, or 10, 12 minutes, or something like that. And I said, well, I don't need more than 12 minutes. They said, no, between the two of you. <laughs> so the next day, I got like six or seven minutes. And they paid me, I think I got paid, not, I don't command your salary, you know, but I got paid like $16,000. I was getting paid more than $1,000 a minute. And I was sitting in the back of the car. And I didn't get a voicemail. I didn't get an email. I didn't get a, a phone call. It was made very clear to me you got to run. This is over. You've got another thing you have to do. And I flew home, and I called all my friends, and I said, I'm going to run. And so I ran, and I won, and then I won again. Now, it is interesting. I won the first election very narrowly, but then I learned about, I was a congressman in a governor's office and a governor's body, and I thought, you know what, and my wife said, you know, you're the father I began to realize, you know, when you're a congressman, you might as well be operating on Mars. I mean, you don't really know what's going on with people. And when you're a governor or a mayor, you've got to serve people. I mean, you've got to be taking care of business. And I learned that the best way to do this was not to abandon my principles, but make sure that everybody knows they're going to get fair treatment. No one gets left behind. Uh, and here's the thing that troubles me about American politics, and I think it's always been true. If you're poor, if you're weak, if you're young, you don't count. And well, they'll all say it, it, you do, but you don't. And so the fight to make sure that the mentally ill and the drug addicted and the chronically ill and the children and the minorities mm -hmm. and the poor, wherever they live, whether it's in the inner city or in Appalachia, we have to make sure they have, we have to at least allow them to think that they count, that they matter, and if you don't, they lose hope. And if people lose hope, there's nothing but bad things that happen. So I've grown in the job, and I've really enjoyed it, and this book's really about all these experiences and the lessons that right. I've learned. So what was the most satisfying time in your political career as governor? Yeah, no, well, I, you couldn't... If, if I could appoint myself to the Senate, I wouldn't go even if they put armed guards to try to escort me down there. This is, uh, and you know, what is satisfying about this job is whether, look, and we're growing, we're up, you know, lots of jobs, 455,000 or something, and we're running surplus. We're having trouble with revenue now, but we'll be okay. But we did a, a commission on police and community, totally bipartisan, very, very different. It's working. Uh, I expanded Medicaid. You know, everybody was mad at me for doing that in the Republican Party. And uh, I've had, I was just on CNN the other night, I don't know if you saw the town, if any of you saw the town hall, but there was a lady there with cancer and she stood up and she said, without this, I would be dead. And, um, and we've really helped the mentally ill too and, uh, and the drug addicted. It's tough, the drug problem is tough. And um, I feel good about the fact, David, that I feel, and I, I don't see any polls or anything, but I feel like we've been, my administration has been a unifying force. And I, I I'm very, very, feel very, very good about well, that. Well, you were reelected with a big number. Is yeah, it was a crushingly big number, yeah. right? And I yeah. almost won every county. 86 out of 88 counties, I don't know, 
30% of African Americans, you know, Republicans get like 1% or not 5% if they're really good. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we won a majority of, uh, of blue collar. I mean, it was, it was very, very, very good. But you know, you're only as good as what it was today because you know, you don't know what's gonna happen. Your popularity, you can't measure your success in politics by popularity. Chris Shea says, well, you know, you need to listen and do what they want. I don't think that's right. I think you need to listen and then you do what you think you need to do. That's what leadership is. I tell my kids or my friends or young people, being a leader, as you know, look, David goes and signs up with Obama and, and you know, people want to want to hang the guy. You know, he's like, hey, I'm serving my country. Leadership means you walk a lonely road, right? Mm -hmm. And you just, if people want to yell at you, that, that's life. Right. So uh, many young people in this, um, on this campus and other campuses are struggling with the questions about public service, about whether to go to Washington under the circumstances, the deadlocks and everything else, whether to go into state or city government or whether to go into business or nonprofit. And you, you've had, I think, various views on this over time. Your views have evolved, let's say. Could you be pretty frank with people here about what you think? Well, if you're gonna to go to Washington, make sure you go with the time limit and when you're gonna leave. Because the thing that can happen to you is you go to Washington, you're all excited. It's Hollywood, by the way. It's Hollywood, uh, you know, East. And, uh, oh yeah, cameras and all, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and you it's a campus, a big campus. You know, they have a yearbook and all that other stuff. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and then you wake up one day and it's 17 years later. Uh, that's not good. That's in a staff position in particular. Yeah, no, I mean, if you can get elected, stay less, okay? Um, <laughs> but, but uh, look, what everybody here, I think, has to understand, now this is a little, maybe a little much for you, but you all know you're made special. There's nobody like you. No one has ever been like you, and no one will ever be like you again. You were made for a purpose. And you've got to dig down inside and figure out what it is. And it's not hard to do, David. It's, it's, a, it's the gut. You know what it is. And, and when you're young, you're not so sure. But you listen. And then when you follow that purpose, when you determine what it is, that's how you find satisfaction mm -hmm. in life. So whether it's a life in, in government or in public affairs or whether it's a not-for-profit or whether it's in business, uh, the one thing I would say is... Anything you do, if it is, if it is not, a, not laid with a, with a purpose to, um, with good values, to improve the world, uh, and I still believe in all this. One person changing the world, unbelievable. One, unbelievable what you can do. <laughs> if you have values, whatever you pursue, you'll have a good legacy and be passionate about it. And don't sell yourself short Well, we're at Harvard. How are you gonna sell yourself short here? I don't think that's kind of in the DNA of people who go to Harvard. The other thing I would tell you is, so you go to Harvard and you're gonna come out of here and everything is gonna be great, and then it doesn't work. And then you say, my God, what? You keep going. You keep going. You don't medicate your problems. You keep at it, and you will find it because you're the best of what we have, uh, despite what Yale says. You're the best <laughs> of what we have. And um, so that's, that's kind of what I would, I would recommend, yeah. David. I, I, well before President Trump came on the scene, there were some of us who were telling students here, there was a time when going to Washington was a pre premier experience you could have, but increasingly given the deadlock, you really ought to think about going back to your home state or working in state government or city government, but I haven't, been able to figure out whether it's better to work in city government or state government? Well, um, I, you know, here, here's what I, I think. I think that we're all focused on Trump. Mm -hmm. I, I had uh, Bernice King invited me down to Atlanta for Martin Luther King Day. It was a fantastic experience, and it was like in a thing with this, mm -hmm. and there was about 400 people there, mm -hmm. and 98% of them were African-American, and somebody goes, what about Trump, you know? And I said, what about Trump? I said, what about your neighbor? What about your kids? What about your nieces and your nephews? He said, the last time I checked, Martin Luther King couldn't even get a meeting with a politician. So what he did was he organized a neighborhood, and he was so strong, so blessed, that he took people of all races and incomes and gender and 
He drove the change based on, on a moral imperative all the way to the top mm -hmm. and changed the world. So wherever that puts you, that's where I think you have to go. If it's a city, community. fine, but a don't community. get trapped. Don't become a, the other thing is, somebody said to me, uh, oh my, uh, my uh, where, it happened somewhere today. Oh, the, this lady interviewed me. She said, my 17 year old son is a Bernie Sanders person and I get, can't get him to turn on anything else. That's like, the cra that's like going hiking on the same path when you have two paths and you never see the mountain. Because you're just going, I mean, that's crazy. One of the things that happened to me is I spent time working with Democrats. I had a boss that hired me on a freak. I was hitchhiking to the beach that year I was in Washington working at NIH. And I got, to, I got to meet a whole lot of Democrats. Keep your minds open. You're too young to make up your mind that you're this or that or something else. Because all you're doing, unless you're, you're rich, okay, or you're really connected, which probably many of you are. Um, <laughs> if, if you are not, if you're just like I was, then you've got to use every opportunity to climb up the ladder. I mean, you've got to be, you be open. If you're not open, you're, you're just making choices yeah. that you're, you're, you're cheating yourself. Yeah. There, there, in that same vein, the Institute of Politics released a survey yesterday of millennials. It was, uh, and it showed something astonishing. That is, among millennials, only 4 out of 10, 40% of Democrats knew anybody who had voted for Trump. Only 40% knew anybody who voted for Trump. And among Republicans, more Republican millennials knew a millionaire than knew a Muslim. More knew a millionaire than a Muslim. Think about the divides that represents. And See, I'm, I'm so, I, I, my prediction is, is that young people care less and less about party. Right. And uh, I think the parties are, are eroding, maybe right. even disintegrating. And I think we're going to see a realignment. But when I hear that, I, but that was maybe here at Harvard. I mean, no, it's nationwide. Is it? Yeah, but I, I, the other good number, though, the encouraging number was nationwide, 59% of millennials, both parties and independents, put a very high premium on uniting the country again. They yeah, I mean, nothing really want can get that. done. And that's what your book is all about. I mean, well, nothing can get done no matter what we're talking about unless people get together. I was in Boston today, and and you're talking about this bottom up. I was saying, you know, when, when the bombing happened, mm -hmm. we, we then began to see Boston strong. And people came together. They didn't, it didn't matter who you voted for, how much money you had, what your station in life was. It didn't matter. We're together, and we are going to make Boston strong. And Boston is stronger today than it's ever been. And it was because people came together and drove that, and drove that all the way up the ladder and changed the very culture of that city which had had its troubles in the past, but boy, Boston was, was so united. So um, my sense is, is that we all want to be united, but we just got to start. One of my friends said to me today, I, I just hate that he said this to me because I don't like when he makes these suggestions. It turns out a lot of times he's right, okay? And he said, every American should take 10 minutes reading something that they don't agree with. Exactly. And we need exactly. that because, yeah. I mean, it's your future. It, you're the ones that are at risk. By the way, a little word to millennials. Hey, when somebody, if David Gergen says they want to help you, then go get them a resume like in the next hour. <laughs> I have found that there are a number of millennials. It's like, uh, they're like slow walk everything. I don't understand this, you know? <laughs> I, I told this, this young woman, I was trying to help her. She was, she, she was impressive to me. She was a supervisor at this pool complex where I try to go and swim. And I asked her for a resume, and she, it took like a month. Right. And now she got a job. She's a, a nurse practitioner, and I think that's great. I, this other guy there, it, it, he, it, like no resume, no thank you notes. No, it, that, life doesn't work like that right. unless you're rich and connected. Then it doesn't matter what you do. <laughs> so for the millennials, get at it, man. Get at it. Don't be going slow and taking your time. When you have an opportunity, seize it, that yeah. moment. We, we're public policy institution around here. I, I really it would be derelict not to ask you about a few public policy sure. questions. You've been a budget hawk and a deficit hawk for a long time. And as we heard from Chris Shays, it was really with your leadership across the aisle uh, that the country balanced the budget. And, you're, and while you're budget chair in the House uh, for the first time in like 30 years. So given that, given, and given the fact that, that new deficits, bigger deficits are coming. Um, 
I, I want to ask about the president's new tax plan today because it's the biggest tax deduction ever, but more importantly, his team is arguing that a tax cuts of some $2 trillion plus over the next 10 years will pay for themselves through growth. Well, since I'm a Republican, I have to go along with that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I don't believe in that. I don't believe that. It, I think that when you do, if it depends what kind of tax cuts you, you have, but there are growth tax cuts. And so right. there is some dynamic effect. It's like 30 or 40 percent, maybe. Maybe, maybe that high. I mean, look, I cut taxes in Ohio. We don't use dynamic scoring. And back in, when I was in Washington, it was part of the reason why I didn't get along with conservatives uh, is because I would never go along with that notion. So, you know, we're going to cut it. We're going to, we actually used a static model. Um, and you, we all know what that means. So if you cut taxes, it provides incentives, people work, companies invest, you make more revenue. To a degree. But to say that, you know why they don't want to pay for this? Because they don't want to make any choices. Exactly. That's exactly. what this is about. I can't tell you how disappointed I get at times when I see the way that politicians work. And let me just tell you something. There is nothing more X than an X politician you don't need to have a smartphone because no one will take your calls <laughs> and no one will ever return your calls. <laughs> and people get in these jobs and they play so cautious. So why wouldn't, well, I, it drives me crazy. In both parties, I don't see, it, it's like I don't, they figure that the only way to get up is to go along. I think there's no way that you can just cut all these taxes and then say, okay, everything will be paid for. That's, mm -hmm. that's like, it's like Christmas. Right. Well, does it doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, does it make sense to all, yeah. maybe somebody in here is, you know, thinks it'll work. If you do, raise your hand. Uh, but I tell you something, we got $20 trillion in debt and people poo poo the debt. You know, we have to pay this. And if we don't pay it, we have to service the debt. Do you know how much interest payments are now? And you wonder about the things we need to do? If we had less debt and less interest payments, we wouldn't have to be talking about cutting the National Institutes of Health by 18%. That's the, first of all, that is crazy. Okay, that is just crazy. But you better understand, I, I used to walk around with a debt clock. That's how boring I was. Now I, <laughs> now I walk around and listen to Bieber. But uh, here's the thing, here's the thing. Well, I, used to, I couldn't figure out how to explain the debt, but here's what I did say. When the debt goes up, job opportunities go down, and when the debt comes down, job opportunities go up. Mm -hmm. I really believe that to be true. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I don't know, it's a long way to get this bill passed in Washington, and there will be people that will express concern about the debt, but we do need a lower corporate tax uh, rate. Um, I don't think we have to keep worrying about the rich people having, I don't know, I don't think we have to sit around I wonder how, are they doing well enough? Yeah. You know, what, do, we, do we have to really have a right. lot of right. concern about billionaires, you right. know? Um, now, I don't want to punish success and punish successful rich people, entrepreneurs. Many of you will be intra entrepreneurs, you're gonna make a lot of money, and then you'll be saying, why didn't Kasich favor cutting my yeah. taxes? Um, but, but the fact is, yeah. is that I think, David, it's is not a properly balanced package. Right. But you, you went in at Ohio, it was central to you to create jobs, and you did it through fiscal means as well as other things that, you know, the regulatory side. And you actually got a lot of job growth. Ohio's got the highest rate of job creation in the Midwest now, I yeah. think. And so when you look at the, the, the plan, is it going to get, is this plan the right thing to do? do we, are we going to be able to get any kind of growth? What kind of growth do you think we can get? And do we need to give, do we need to cut corporate rates all the way down to 15% and then allow these pass-through uh, That's groups. a whole other deal, the yeah, pass-through entities. That, the small business, that helps small business. We, but we it also really, helps law firms, it yeah. helps hedge funds. It helps yeah, well, money. I think we shouldn't be helping the hedge funds with stuff like this. But uh, I don't have an objection to, I have a, I am in favor of, of the tax cuts for the small business. Yeah. And I think the corporate rate is really way too uh -huh. high. Should it be 15? I don't, I don't know exactly what that rate ought to be. You need to look at it as yeah. you go through the process. Um, Let me ask you this question. Do you think that, uh, that the American people should be able to see Donald Trump's tax returns before they have a vote on the bill? Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I always have to release my taxes. 
I mean, we, we went through that, didn't we, Beth, in the campaign? I mean, I don't, it's not going to make me, it's, I would never say we can't have tax bill or tax reform until Trump releases his taxes, but I think it'd be appropriate for him to do it, or do it to some degree. But look, I'm not, I don't want to be here tonight making news because, because that's exactly what she's writing down back there. You know, he wants, because <laughs> I, I, I want to just say, I, I mean, I, I think that, I think it's part of the process of being a public yeah. official. But I don't want a headline to be Kasich says we should not have tax reform until he releases taxes. I just think yeah. it's sort of the thing to do. You're right. I understand. That's not a headline. How's going uh, to get out of that one? That was um, not a headline. That was not. You did I well. Didn't. You took so you took that curve good. really well. The um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, okay. uh, so. But let me ask you about you as governor. You you were bold and courageous for a Republican governor. Said you're going to expand Medicaid. Uh, back when you you took that on. Now you see this, this health care bill that's been revised, uh, and it's, they've moved it to the right, the hair, you know, to, in, in recent days on, I, I'm, I'm curious about two things. One, about the Medicaid quality of it, and secondly, the whole notion of it, of the same bill guaranteeing your rights at a federal level, but giving the states the right to, get, to strip you of those rights, yeah, if they get a waiver. And a lot of, a lot of people are looking at that and say, what? You know, because on one hand, I, my essential benefits are guaranteed. On one hand, it's guaranteed that if I have a pre-existing condition, I'll be fine. But the state can get a waiver from the Trump administration, and then I lose that. Well, I, I spoke out against this health care bill. You know that. Mm -hmm. Maybe you didn't know no, that. No, I know that, right. but I just wonder about these extra new No, that's provisions. not going to Look, the problem is they repealed all the taxes. And when you repeal all the taxes, which I don't know that anybody even cares about anymore, then you don't have the, re the resources to be able to fund the program. Now, should the program be changed? Absolutely. The Medicaid expansion, it's a 90-10 match. It can be phased down over time to a more reasonable match where the state carries more of the burden, but not overnight. Not overnight, not in 2020. That's too soon. Uh, I ought to have some power to exclude certain pharmaceuticals from my formulary because I have no leverage on the pharmaceutical industry and their costs are going through the roof. So if you give me a chance to say to a company, I'm not going to put you in my formulary, I'm not going to make your drug available, it costs too much, all of a sudden I have leverage and we'll get a better price. Um, and I think I should have some freedom on what the Medicaid benefit package ought to look like with guardrails, okay, mm -hmm. with guardrails. Right. Okay, now let's go to the exchange side. We know the exchange is in trouble. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are fewer and fewer insurance companies yeah. being part of the exchange, and there are ways to improve that as well. And I would suggest on that is that the federal government should let the states, uh, you know, not run the insurance industry. Let me run my own insurance industry. And they've changed the, uh, the cost of the most high expensive package versus the lowest. And they've tried to jam things together. And it's driven up the cost for young people. They should get out of that business. They should give me some flexibility in terms of, uh, of that benefit package, again, also with, um, uh, with, with some guardrails. On, uh, on Medicaid, uh, I think they shouldn't have gone to 138% of poverty. They should have gone to 100. I actually have a package. We're actually talking to a few Democrat governors now, my staff is, about whether we can come up with something. My concern is if you don't have the revenue and you offer somebody a $3,000 a year health insurance policy, what are they going to buy? Yeah. And if you are mentally ill or drug addicted, you have to see the doctor all the time. And so your deductible is going to be, Scott, you're not going to go. Right. So we can reform the health care, and we should do it. We can reform all this and then lead to the next thing, which is transparency, pay for performance, and, and being able to determine who's giving you quality for the price that you pay. And we can have a competition on those grounds. But in this bill, I'm afraid they're going to pass something that will be very, very tough. I won't be in. And I, look, I don't want the money for Medicaid because of my my own personal issues. I just want to, I, I, we now cover 700,000 people that we didn't cover before. Now our Seven, medic, 700,000. 700, now our Medicaid program is growing at 3%, which is very low. Our per capita rate is flat. So, you know, we're not, we manage the program well. And by the way, how did we create the jobs? I'll tell you how we did it. We brought down the taxes, but we didn't use dynamic scoring. We brought down the taxes. We reformed the programs. We took on special interest groups like the nursing home industry and let mom and dad stay in their own home rather than go into a nursing home where it costs more. 
So we made a lot of reforms. It's not like you have to cut, you just have to reform. This is the 21st century, so we did that. And, uh, and, and we also reduced our regulations, not to the point where we don't have regulations. I mean, if you come in, we have fracking in our state. If you come in and you frack, you do something crazy and you're irresponsible, you know, we'll hang you. But, uh, but, we're, but we also don't wanna have some crazy bunch of rules that keep people from being able to do what they, what they need to do to be able to be successful and in business and we use common sense. Now, the biggest issue going forward is workforce. And many of you know this, are education institutions. Because we keep talking about politics, you know, po the politicians not doing the right thing. Do you know how many public schools fail? Do you know how many universities are not doing their job? Do you realize that the digital revolution that's coming our way is going to, the number one occupation in America is driving. We're gonna have driving pretty soon. It's gonna all be with autonomous vehicles. The use, is, use of AI, you know, you look at, uh, What's AT&T, what is it, Watson? I mean, mm -hmm. there are gonna be stockbrokers gonna lose their jobs because artificial intelligence is gonna be able to do what three people do. So the question is, is our education system working to the point where we're now giving skills and resilience and creativity to people both who are young and also to people who are older because the issue that Trump tapped into was these people who either lost their jobs or were about to lose their jobs. You can't take a coal miner and just say, tough. Or say, by the way, if I'm, I'm going to make America great and everybody's going to, we're going to reopen up all the mines, it's not going to happen. So the question is, how do you take people, competency-based education, online education, with companies beginning to put curriculum online and for people who can pass the curriculum to have an opportunity to get an interview and perhaps a job. David, this whole education system needs to change or I will personally be part of disintermediating it because it is not working. And you think we have problems today? You just wait till these occupations disappear. What do you think people in this country are gonna say? You think we got angst and, and division now? So we gotta get ahead of this. This is a tsunami coming our way. Now you can either wait till it, it hits or you can begin to prepare and our institutions are not doing it. And I don't think Congress has a clue, and I don't even think my states, uh, the states uh, really understand the dynamic impact that's coming our way. Do any of you, dis do any of you agree with that? Raise your hand, that that's gonna be a... Good. You did it exactly like I asked you to. Okay. <laughs> okay. I love your passion about, about change. Change, really change, 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 change. It keeps us young. Yeah. We don't like change. Nobody likes to change anything. Yeah. But when you change, you get younger, you get more. It's all about innovation. It's, all, it's so exciting. Uh, it's so, this world is so exciting. And uh, we have to grasp it. But people sometimes just don't want to do it. It's so yeah. hard, and I kind of like what I have. And please don't make me change. It won't work. <laughs> We're gonna be going to questions. If you wanna ask a question, and I'm gonna ask one more question here while you line up, but there are microphones here and here, uh, and here and here, uh, and we're not gonna be able to probably get to all the questions, I can already see that, but I wanna ask you one more thing. Yeah. You don't often, well, it comes up occasionally, but you, you're sort of well anchored in Midwestern values. But one mm. of the strong values in your life is, is your faith. Boy, and am I, I glad you sustained, brought this up. It sustained you. Okay, when I was a boy, I was a Catholic boy, and I felt, at times, I felt the presence of the Lord. I went to college. I didn't feel any presence of any Lord, okay? <laughs> I was feeling the presence of what it was that I was interested in, okay? God, to me, was a rabbit's foot. I want you please to just listen to this. God was a rabbit's foot. Shake the rabbit's foot. So you know, I have this book out. I'd like it to be a bestseller. I thought this morning, I would not pray for my book to be a bestseller because I can't be having God as a rabbit's foot. Maybe. Um, <laughs> so anyway, in 1987, my mother and father were slaughtered in an accident by a drunk driver. My father, I got this call at a quarter to 12 p.m. My father was dead and my mother was going to be dead. And I drove all night, my girlfriend at the time, drove, we drove all night to Pittsburgh and I got into the hospital room and um, my mother never woke up. And um, so there was this young minister there and 
he said to me after, the first thing he says to me is, oh, you know, I'm sorry about this. I, and I start screaming at him, you don't have any idea how I feel. He said, you know, I don't, but I know that if your mother had a choice, she would not come back here because she's with the Lord. And I went, well, okay, great. So for a few days, I didn't really talk to him much. And then he said to me one day, where do you stand vis-a-vis -vis the creator? I, did, I just, that was my answer. And he goes, well, let me tell you something. You have a window of opportunity, and that window is going to close. You are so devastated that, I'm just telling you, John, you have an opportunity to go through that window. So I didn't even know if I believed that God existed. I didn't believe if he existed, whether he cared about me. I didn't know anything, and I disrupted more Bible studies and, and religious intellectual conversation than you can imagine. I was obnoxious in my search. And I went through it all. And um, that was 30 years ago. And here's what I believe. That religion in the 21st century has not evolved. We're still back, I don't know when. And then these preachers who endorse candidates publicly, they have no business doing that. And thirdly, when these people preach about who's sleeping with who, and don't you do this, and don't you do that, that to me is not what religion is about. Religion is about connection, it's about forgiveness, it's about loving your neighbor, it's about another chance, it's about all the things that we really want to believe in. Now, if you're a humanist, and I think you have a humanist or something like that who's a preacher here or whatever at, at Harvard, I'm all for that. If you wake up every day and you think that your job is to improve the world, I'm 100% with you. If you want to be an agnostic, I saw one today, he writes for the Boston Globe, and I said, hey, you better check this out. But I don't, if he doesn't check it out, I, that's not my problem, really. I mean, it's my job to say something, but not to do any more. But I have to tell you, I'm a failure at this. I'm a hypocrite about it. But I got nowhere else to go. And I would ask you to think about where you will go when the water rises. And I want you to think about the perspective that you get in a life that Michael Novak says is nothing more than a veil of tears. So I would ask all of you to think about this. This is the best gift that I can give you tonight, is to say, think about your eternal destiny and spend time on it. And if you don't agree with it or you don't like it, you can say, I tried, it didn't work. But don't go through life and walsh your way through life without asking these hard questions about the meaning of life, about how you got here, about how you're so fortunate to go to Harvard and so many other things, it's worth your while. And in my life, I don't read the Bible and figure out whether I'm gonna sign a bill, but I can tell you that as a result of looking at these things, I have become, not all the time, because I just said I'm a hypocrite, I have become much more sensitive to the people who are really in need. And I want you to know this. So think about it, okay? Thank you, David. Thank you. Identify yourself, brief, and with a question mark, please. <laughs> Hi, Governor Kasich. My name is Michael Huggins. I'm a second year master in public policy student here at the Kennedy School. I'm also from Cincinnati and a registered voter in Ohio, and so I'm one of the people you represent. Um, and thank you for being here. Um, my question, I'm really glad you brought up the issue of police reform. Um, as you know, there have been a number of very high profile shootings in the country that have occurred in Ohio. Sam DuBose in Cincinnati, John Crawford in a Walmart um, in Ohio, and also um, Tamir Rice, who's a 12 year old boy who was killed by a police officer. All different ages, all black, um, all black. My question is, uh, what exactly is Ohio, what is your office prepared to do in order to continue the steps towards improving police legitimacy and also trust that um, especially communities of color, minority, com minority communities, um, have in terms of authorities in, in yeah. Ohio? It's a good question. Look, we, um, I have a lady whose name is Nina Turner. She's African-American, former Democrat state senator. You would see her 
She just left MSNBC to go to CNN. Uh, she's a friend of mine. She is a, a, a mother. Her son is a police officer. And um, she came to see me with a, a number of other African-American legislators, and in 24 hours, we created a task force. She is the co-chairperson of our task force, along with the former head of the Highway Patrol and our uh, current head of public safety. We recruited uh, community specialists, community activists. We have law enforcement. We, got, we, have, uh, we have every kind of person you can think, diverse group, and they've come together and they've made a recommendation which has been adopted by, I think, 85% of all the police departments on a standard policy on the use of force, including deadly force. We also have a, uh, a policy regarding recruiting and hiring. We have to know about all these things. And here's one that's really amazing. All incidents involving police and the public will be recorded, and we will be able to examine it. Now, we not only had Tamir Rice and John Crawford and DeBose, and also up in Cleveland, we also had a couple that were driving, African Americans, there were, I think, 147 bullets shot into their car, they were unarmed. Uh, there was a grand jury that came back, didn't indict anybody in, in, in these two cases up in Cleveland, no violence. And the reason why I thought it was so important to do it is because you want people to think and to know, not just think, but to know that there's a sense of justice and a sense of, uh, of responsibility. We also now have the Supreme Court Chief Justice looking at the issue of the grand jury to see if there are particular reforms that should be involved in the grand jury. So uh, we're gonna continue to work on this. Where we ultimately wanna get to is police, and nobody, no other state in the country has done this, and I've been trying to tell the New York Times about it, but I guess it's not a bad news story, so we can't seem to get anybody to write about it. But this is, this is landmark. The next goal is this. I'm police, I'm community, we're together, we're connected, because the community feels sometimes that they have been oppressed and law enforcement officers and their families want them to go home at night. It's just, and, these, and, and this commission, how many people we have on that commission? Is it 30 people? Total unanimity. They fight through everything. They are, listen, when you take somebody who studied community and police relations from the standpoint of being with a community and you sit them in a room with a sheriff from a rural county of the state and they reach 100% agreement, it shows you what can happen if you have dialogue. So thanks for your question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is Mohammed Adel Islam. I'm an MPA here at the Kennedy School. Do you believe that climate change is a major problem that humanity and the American government need to confront? And what is your opinion on the current trajectory? On the what? The current tra trajectory. Oh, look, I'm very concerned about the environment. Um, uh, I think there is, of course, is climate change. Uh, we've seen a significant reduction in uh, pollutants in Ohio because of the things that we've done with coal. Look, I'm in a big, big fight with the legislature. I had to veto a bill because I believe in renewables. Uh, I believe uh, in, in solar and wind and all these things and efficiency standards. And these are, these are, these are mandates and the legislature wanted to change the mandates to goals, and I vetoed it, and now they're coming again. So, uh, no, I think it's very important. I'll tell you something that I'm increasingly concerned about, and that's the situation with the rainforest, is we see a larger and larger amount of them disappearing. And I think the case has not been made. See, to me, the rainforest may, uh, may hold the, the key to some of the hor most horrible diseases that we have if we could get in there and understand the beauty of the rainforest and the potential. So the environment's really, really important. Now we just can't have some policy based on just some, you know, somebody else's idea that's gonna throw everybody out of work, but at the same time, you have to be mindful of this. We owe it to the next generation. So I think there's a balance, but I would rather err on the side of, well, it's why I'm vetoing these bills and I believe in renewables and I've told our people that Ohio needs to be, has to be part of the, of the national effort, okay? Thank you. Governor Kasich, uh, thank you so much for being here. My name is Eric Fliegoff. I'm a sophomore at Harvard College. 
and I'm the chair of the Harvard Public Opinion Project, which is the group that helped work on the IOP poll, which was mentioned already and was released yesterday. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about uh, volunteering and young people in politics. As you were saying, young people are really willing to uh, get involved in their communities and improve their communities, um, and they know that. But at the same time, uh, I believe 9% said that they would even consider running for office in the future. Trust in even local state government was 20, 30%. People think that politics is more relevant to their lives than ever, but they don't want to be part of it and they don't see it as a good thing. So my question is, do you, um, do you see uh, volunteering and community service as a solution to this? Or do you think that party politics and especially the federal government have a real problem, maybe the Republican Party in particular, um, with attracting young people and getting people uh, to trust politicians? Well, I, I think that, look, there's a lot of energy now with the progressive movement, okay, because it just seems new. Now, the Republicans keep winning elections, but the energy is right now on the side of the Democrats. And I don't know what that's going to mean, but you remember I said earlier, I do believe, David, I don't know if you agree with me, but I think the relevance of the political parties is going to fade. And I think more and more of these people are going to be independents. And I don't think it's impossible in the future for a, a very wealthy person to stage an independent run for the presidency with clear talk, uh, you know, with a viable running mate or something who could win the presidency. I think it's very possible in the future. Now, in terms of what you should do, you shouldn't shy away from politics if it's in your heart, you know, if it's in your soul. Now, look, you know, most people don't make the NBA. I made the NBA, but if I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't be, I mean, I'm, I got a, I was impossible my, the route I had in politics. Um, but if you want to do it, if you want to try it, of course you should try it. If, if you dig down and you feel that's what you need to do, great. But in terms of your activism, in terms of wanting to change the world, being involved in community, creating unity, you have to do that. And it can go right along with, with, your, with your regular work and to be volunteering or whatever it is. The one thing I keep thinking about is should we have, I read today an article in Rwanda, uh, which was an unbelievable story. They force everybody to work three hours a month. It's some community project. And I clipped the thing out, which I was gonna give my chief of staff, Beth Hansen over here. Stan, yeah, she has to work with me, so give her a round of applause. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, I start thinking about whether there ought to be some sort of compulsory, and, and maybe I was thinking maybe wrong about it, I think it would take a year. Well, what if we required people to do like three hours a month? Mm -hmm. See, I think that if we are together, dealing with these local problems of drug addiction and mentoring kids and all that, we'll, we will create a, a common bond and it will be helpful to us. So if you want to run for office, do it, okay? Get your degree first. Now my daughter, one of my daughters, she's, she wants to be in fashion. And I said, Ree, she really ought to be a lawyer. And then she goes, well, yeah. And I, and I said, then maybe someday you'll run for office, Ree. She said, well, I'm gonna make my money first. You know her, Reese, <laughs> right? I'm gonna make my money first. But I keep telling her, I said, no, Reese, your best shot is as a Republican. But you're so far out here you gotta come a little bit closer to the Republican Party. And we laugh about it all. But I would love for one of my daughters to be a public official, to be elected at anything. Whether, but here's the thing, if you get elected, don't let them talk to you into going along and getting along. Stand up and be for something. Stand up and be for something in your life, okay? Do it. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to report to you. We're, we've seen a real spike among our alumni who want to run for Congress, want to run for office somewhere, and almost all of them are the very same thing you're talking about. They want to run in order to unite the country. Well, that's what Shays has always been, yeah. it, or my, my great friend. It's with David Gergen. I mean, yeah. let me tell you something. Any of you who don't go to, to Shays or to Gergen to try to do a little suck up to get somewhere, <laughs> you're crazy. Go, go see go to these Shays. people. Yeah, please. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Wright. I'm a senior at the college. Uh, a quick question on foreign relations. During a Republican primary debate, you said that the United States should punch Russia in the nose and that it had, it had gotten away with too much for too long. 
I'm just curious, what do you think that would look like, and how would Russia and Putin specifically respond to being punched in the nose? Well, uh, here's, here's what I think. I mean, what's going on in the Ukraine is a disgrace. And the fact that we have allowed them to basically, in some ways, even almost on the grounds of which they're going to occupy territory and never give it back, is wrong. And the other thing that was always astounding to me, and thank goodness the sanctions have held up, uh, I think they can even do more. I mean, this is a, a force that is very negative. Now, if they want to play ball with the community of nations, that would be fine. But I don't look to be provocative with them, but they have to understand what the consequences are of oppressing people. And, and there's no question in my mind that they either looked the other way or were n not even negligent, but were aware of it, or else even may have in some way participated in the use of the chemical weapons in Syria. I mean, this is a very, very bad thing. Now, when you deal with somebody like Putin, you don't, want to, you don't want to push anybody really into a corner, but you want to make it clear what the, what the consequences are. The difficulty is all these countries have different, different, different agendas, they have different touch points, uh, but an effective leader would convene these folks to convince them that there's a, an awful lot in our, in our self-interest and in the public, in the world interest, to be able to do some things that, uh, where we can work together. Now. Um, a couple other things. I did go to Munich, and I did have these people talking about the fact, is America, I mean, where, where is America? Are you, where, is it, are you guys out to lunch or what? And I think the strike in Syria, most people talk about it because they say, oh yeah, we finally did something. Well, we did finally did do something, and it sent a message to some of the world leaders that don't count America out. And I think that was very, very important. We, we screwed that one up. We should have been supporting the rebels in Syria years ago. Getting involved in a civil war is never a smart thing to do, and I don't favor it. I voted against U.S. troops in Lebanon when Ronald Reagan was president. If you don't have a clear and present danger, plus an ability to go in and an ability to get out, you don't go in. We're not talking about the Hotel California. You've got to know what you're, you're doing when it comes to, uh, when it comes to foreign policy. Um, I was very encouraged to see that Le Pen was not going to win in France. Now, I don't know how that's all going to turn out, uh, but this rising negative nationalism of withdrawal, that things don't, and, and also am a, tra a free trader. And I think withdrawing from the Pacific Trade Agreement was a big mistake for two reasons. These are fledgling countries that want to trade with us where we can make them stronger economically, and there was also a very significant strategic interest in us being involved in Asia. Now we run around realizing how important it is to be involved in Asia because of the actions of North Korea, and, and we walked away from something that would have cemented a number of relationships and would have expanded, potentially, the number of relationships and the ability to be successful economically. So. You know, you voted for NAFTA too, you know, the news tonight is it looks like we're about to pull out. I don't agree. I think that, is that, is that fake news or real news? No, well, <laughs> it is the New York Times. Well, that's real news. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. They endorsed me in the primary. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? I think it's real news, okay? <laughs> Anybody who endorsed me, I consider it to be real. <laughs> Please. Governor Kasich, uh, my name is Devin Paris, and I am a second year uh, master's in public policy student here at the Kennedy School. I'm also a registered voter in Ohio. Um, and so my question is about limited government. You're an advocate. Is about what now? Limited government. Right. Um, you're an advocate for smaller government. You also talk a lot about how uh, the importance of governing from the bottom up and yeah. not the top down um, and how for us to make inroads in pressing problems like the opioid crisis in Ohio and improving our schools, it's really important for local communities to take the lead. Um, and so my question is, how do you reconcile these views with actions by the state um, to strip away local governments and local communities' ability to govern and regulate within their borders? Uh, two examples that come to mind is the state law that undercut local assault weapons bans and the bill before the General Assembly around collection of taxes. What's the Collecting taxes. Okay. Um, well, first of all, there's nothing that's 100%. It should be a partnership between those at top and those in the local, okay? For example, if you take Medicaid expansion, that's a partnership between the federal government and the state government, which also benefits the people. 
what we're trying to do on tax collection is if you're a business, there's actually a business where they have to put tape on the floor because if you're in this jurisdiction, you pay these taxes, and if you're in this jurisdiction, you pay those taxes, and if you're down here, you, have, you know how crazy it is to foul that? So the idea was that we would allow the state to collect them where you would, it would make it simpler, particularly for small business to be able to file, then we send the money down to the local governments. Why do the local governments not like it? I think two reasons. One, they don't trust that they'll get their money back, but the second reason is they don't want to change their own operation. Because that means they'd have to face with a system that's no longer necessary. And they don't want to make decisions. And in Ohio, we about, what is it, Beth, about 85% of all the money we collect, we actually send down to local governments. I mean, what, what are we, a tax collector for local governments? Why don't they operate and do the things that they need to do to support their operations rather than sit, you know, having the state of Ohio collect all this money and send it down to them. It's, it's, even the federal government never does revenue sharing anymore, believe it or not. Um, so we be, I believe in, that local, in the local government, but I also think there needs to be great reform. I'll also suggest one other thing to you. David asked a question, would you go to work in the city or would you go to work in the state? Do you know how many people that get elected at the local level and don't want to, get, don't want to make any change because they take the heat? See, let me ask you this question. Who do you blame for the United Airlines problem? Who do you blame? Do you blame the CEO? Let me ask you this. If you were working at the counter of the United Airlines operation, would you have stood up and said, we're not going to do this to this passenger? What would you have done? If you're on the school board and you know your school is not working, would you be prepared to be a school board member to say, our school's not working? Would you be prepared to do that? You see, this is what it's going to come down to in your life. Think about Wells Fargo. What if you were working for EpiPen and they jacked the price up 400% for, uh, for this drug that, that families need to treat their kids? If you were working in there, what would you do about it? Or if you were at Wells Fargo? Or what if you were working for a sports team and they decided some thug was going to play on Sunday? I mean, what would you do? So you see, and this is back to the issue really of faith too. Because, you know, life is short. And what is the accounting you're going to make of yourself? Because at the end of the day, David Gergen will never be remembered for what he's accumulated. David Gergen, the day when he passes from this earth, will be remembered as a guy who brought people together and put his country before anything else. You're never going to be remembered. So what I would say to you, Miss is the work of local government is important, but they have to have responsibility too. And, uh, and a partnership should exist. And do we always get it right? No, but we get it right a lot of the time. Thank you. I hope you'll run for something yeah. too. We're, we're not gonna be able to cover, uh, we're, we started just a few minutes late, we're gonna go in a few minutes late, but we're gonna stop very soon, within about six or seven minutes. Yes, that's He's gotta get to New Hampshire. Yeah, I've gotta, I go, to, I gotta go to New Hampshire. Yeah, and that's very curious, very <laughs> curious. See this book? Yeah. A lot of, let me tell you. Yeah. Let me tell you why New Hampshire. I did 106 town hall meetings, and when I first was running for president, I thought that what really mattered was balanced budgets and all those things, and they do matter. But you know what I realized? People want to know that somebody cares about them. They don't want to have some political philosophy. What's your tax plan and all this other stuff, or what's your foreign policy? What they want to know is, do you care about me? And New Hampshire changed the way that I look at yes, politics sir. as a result of that. That's why I'm go going back. back. That's interesting. That's good. Listening. What's that? He was listening. Yeah, ha. Exactly. Yes, sir. Hi, Gordon Casey. Uh, how are you doing? Uh, my name is Pierre Tis. I'm a first year student at the business school here at Harvard. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Um, my question is on gerrymandering. Uh, for those of you who don't know what gerrymandering is, is the practice that uh, both Democrats and Republicans have engaged on over time to draw uh, congressional districts to their advantage. My question to you is, uh, how can we the people make sure that we are the ones picking all representatives and not that all representatives are picking their voters? Well, I, uh, I, in I, yeah, there's a court case going to the Supreme Court on redistricting. I hope that the court will hear it and I hope they'll rule with the, uh, with the plaintiffs. In our state, I've made it clear to the leaders of our legislature that gerrymandering is an anathema to this current system because what they do is they carve these districts. 
So you have safe Republican, safe Democrat. Well, there's no such thing as safe anymore because if you're in a safe Republican district, you have to watch out for a primary from the right. And if you're in a Democrat district, you have to look, watch out for a primary from the left. And all we're doing is moving everybody like this. So we need to have a better system of drawing these lines. And frankly, both parties have to assent to it because that would force it to be made more fair, I think. I'm open to any plan on redistricting. I've got my own thoughts, but we have to get rid of all this gerrymandering. Now, let me tell you another thing that I think is horrific, and that is the ability of a few billionaires to pick the president of the United States, okay? This Supreme Court decision, I couldn't disagree with it more. You get a handful of people who are billionaires who give, it's all about money when you run for president. It's all about money, or maybe celebrity. So uh, that's part of it. But money is the, is, ask David, it's the mother's milk of success in politics, and when money counts that much and a handful of people can influence the money, that is a, that's a, you agree? It's a yep. terrible, terrible thing, okay? Uh, honored to have you with us, Governor Kasich. Uh, my name is Aiden Fitzsimons. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, so we live in a time of increased partisanization and uh, polarization in our, in our discourse, in our social media, in, even in our legislatures. Um, so for you, a moderate conservative, uh, and for me, a moderate liberal, which my Zeppelin t-shirt probably gave away, um, how can we return the conversation to common ground? How can we temper the discourse that's going on? How can we make the center strong again? How can we make the center sexy again? Uh, I think someone like you it would be important in that fight. And do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I'm a sort of back, and maybe I don't describe it very well, but you, could, you and I could sit down and we'd get along great. <laughs> now, we may have some things we disagree with, but there's going to be a whole bunch of things that we agree with. And if we spend our time talking about those things, we'll develop a friendship, a relationship, we'll treat each other as human beings. I'd love to. And then we can fight about, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Send me a letter and give it to the president of Harvard. Maybe you can have a visit. Uh, but in all seriousness, that's what you have to do with your friends. So somebody, I'm surprised somebody hasn't asked me about abortion because I'm pro-life. And somebody said to me, how are we supposed to get along when you're, you're pro-life and I'm pro-choice? Why are we even talking about that right now? Let's, we have enough division. Why don't we agree on something and work together on something? And then we can work our way to the more controversial issues. And we can, but we, listen. Nothing is going, David, please tell them, nothing is going to work well without unity. It doesn't happen. So you and I could get, you get your, your conservative Republican friend and sit down and figure out what you can agree on because I'll bet there's a number of things that you can build a friendship and a relationship with. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. And I like your T-shirt if, you know, if you have it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, bring us home. Last question. Uh, uh, my name is Kyle McFadden. I'm a junior at the college. And first, I want to thank you for being with us tonight. Um, having the opportunity to speak with politicians such as yourself has been one of the greatest um, enjoyments of being at Harvard. You did set me up very, uh, very well for my question. Um, so I want to go back to something you said earlier in the night and that you have repeated a couple of times. You said... Um, and I'm paraphrasing, but we have to make sure the poor and vulnerable people know that they matter. However, that being said, during your time as governor, you have taken um, a number of actions that disproportionately target poor people, target minorities, target women. Um, you signed numerous anti-choice uh, bills into legislation that restrict women's access to reproductive health. You've called for the de defunding of Planned Parenthood. Um, you support marijuana criminalization. You advance private prisons. Um, you fight against collective bargaining, not to mention the fact that oh, the case Obergefell v. Hodges, the case that gave me the right to get married, was originally Obergefell v. Kasich. So I'm wondering how you can reconcile your earlier statements about making people feel that they matter with your record that takes aim at them so clearly. Okay, that's a, that's a good question, and I was expecting something like this before I got out of here. Um, here's the, here, let me tell you a couple things. First of all, the people of the state voted a constitutional amendment to say that marriage should be between a man and a woman. I had a responsibility to support the constitutional amendment. Now, I believe in traditional marriage. That's what I believe, okay? But we also have a Supreme Court ruling that said that, uh, that, uh, that marriage between people of the same sex was, was legal. And guess what? We honor that in Ohio. 
And not only do we honor it, but uh, as I went home and told my wife, I've been invited to my first gay wedding, what do you think? She said, well, I'm going, even if you aren't. So, uh, so I went and I, I enjoyed that. Well, I don't believe in discriminating against anybody. Well, let's talk about Planned Parenthood. I already told you that I was pro-life. But you see, I also believe in women's health. And we are robust funders of women, women's health. Now, when we talk about minorities, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Because the bill that I, the legislation I worked with, or the order that I work with, involves one of the great leaders in the African American community in our state. Furthermore, we also reformed the Cleveland Public Schools. The mayor is an African American. I worked with everybody up there, including the teachers union, to make sure that we've got reform. And I've now moved over to Youngstown, which has been left with a significant minority population that has not been treated fairly. I also have legislation to fund the schools where I tried to take money and move it from those school districts that had the ability to support themselves and transfer it to districts where they didn't have the capability to support themselves. In addition, I expanded Medicaid and we now have the, only, the major governor of a major state and we now are able to treat the, the, uh, the mentally ill, the working poor. Uh, we're also able to treat the, uh, the drug addicted and uh, we've been able to empower local communities to be able to expand their reach to help even more people. So I also will tell you that for the first time in Ohio history, the government is involved in set-aside programs for minorities. We've met all of our goals and exceeded them so that our minority community can actually be, be successful in entrepreneurship. Now I could probably give you a couple arms more of that, so I just want you to know that those are the things that we're doing and you should check the record, and that's not fake news. So anyway, thanks for being here. <laughs> I, I, just, I just want to repeat to you one more time, John. The, it is an honor to have you here. It's important, very important for us, to someone who comes in with your views, and many of them are, people around here agree with, and some of them they don't. Absolutely. But it's really important to be able to talk to each other and to listen to each other as you keep emphasizing and, and finding common ground. And you, you represent a politics that I think everybody in this room uh, will come to respect over time, and we thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much.